All right, hello. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Derek Mosley. I am the director of the uh, Lubar Center here at Marquette Law School. And I want to welcome you all here uh, to our third installment of a very new series we started called the Get to Knows. Uh, the purpose of the Get to Knows were to bring people in uh, to the law school that have an effect on your life and you may not have been aware of it. And so I want to bring them in and have a conversation. It's a conversation between myself and the guest, and then we open it up for questions afterwards. Before we get started, I would like everybody at this moment, and I'll do it with you, to check your phones and to set them to off or vibrate so they don't go off during uh, the course of the program. And today we're going to talk about the Milwaukee port and uh, some things that you may not be aware of in regards to the Milwaukee port is that the Milwaukee port supports 1,300 jobs. The Milwaukee port brings in 2.3 metric tons of cargo each year. The Milwaukee port uh, has about $106 million economic impact for the city of Milwaukee and generates about $88 million in revenue. And who better to talk about the Milwaukee port than a Milwaukee trailblazer herself, uh, the first uh, woman and the first person of color to be director of the Milwaukee port, so please join me in welcoming Jackie Q. Carter. Good morning. Good morning. Well, good afternoon. Now. Yeah, that's good. All right, Jackie. So let's start. The purpose of this is to get to know you personally and to learn about the port. We talked briefly before, and I told you I, I feel pretty bad. I've lived in Milwaukee for about 31 years, and the port might be the one thing I know the least about. So You're not I'm, alone. I'm glad that we are here. So let's just start from the beginning. You're a lifelong Milwaukee resident. I am. Um, grew up, born and raised here in Milwaukee. My family is actually from uh, Mississippi, so Jackson, Mississippi. But um, before we kick off, one, one thing, if you've ever heard me speak in public, you know I always want to stop and honor God. And um, the way that my relationship with God works, sometimes he, he talks to me at the oddest time. So 4 o'clock Saturday morning, woke up out of my sleep, and he's like, be unequivocally clear. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? And he says, you've been talking about me, and you always say honor God, but it's really open what that means. So be clear. So what I want to say, and I'm going to write down exactly what he gave, or read what he, said, he gave me. He said, I, I need to say that I believe in God, the God who sent his son to die for my sin, Jesus Christ, who came, he died, and rose on the third day, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And it's, it's Holy Spirit that leads and guides me daily. And I said, okay, Lord, these people are going to think I'm crazy because it's a professional event. And he said, that's okay, because if you, if you hang with me, you should look different. You should look crazy. And so if they, if they are with me, they'll understand. So then I said, well, this is Marquette, so I want to make sure that I'm respectful of the, the folks who have invited me. He said, go look at their mission. So I looked at their mission, and the first line said, dedicated to serving God. I said, okay. And then I thought, because I always play with words. This is the law school. So my hope is that when we leave here, you have been served. You like how I did I that? I like how you <laughs> did that. that was... Yeah. So, but that, I think that's the, the foundation of who I am is my faith. So that guides me in everything. So even in thinking about whether I wanted to take or pursue the role of the port director, um, I, I had to pray about it and really be clear if this was the path that he had for me. And so... That's, that's my foundation. Oh, yeah, and we're going to talk about your spirituality because yep. I know it's a very key part of your life. But you said you grew up in Milwaukee. Where exactly? So my, well, a little bit of a lot of places, but uh, primarily um, the Washington Park neighborhood. So my grandmother has, um, she actually moved to 33rd and Walnut the year that my mother had me. So that was where she lived. That was where the family gathered. And so with my mom, we lived, we lived primarily in that area. A few times we were outside of that neighborhood, but... When I was about 10, I went, I lived with my grandmother full time. So my sister, my brother, and I lived with my grandmother. So she really kind of raised us, and it, she's the one who really founded us in faith. And so when people talk about, um, you know, it, it can be a struggle sometimes if you're not raised by your parents, I'm grateful that she was in my life to give me that faith foundation because that to me is key to who I've become and who I'm always becoming because we've never arrived, right? We're always pressing toward the mark. Now, I, siblings. Do you have any siblings? I do. So, so my sister and brother, I'm, I'm the middle. And so I don't know if that's good or bad, but I've always been real even. Um, always kind of the middle man trying to make sure everybody was good. But if you 
if you grew up, um, when we got to be teenagers, a lot of people always thought I was the oldest because my brother was just carefree. He was, he's the oldest, but he's very carefree, still is. Um, and so people always thought I was the oldest because I've just always been maternal. Um, always a caretaker, I was the one to carry the house keys, carry the lunch money. Um, so that's just who I am. And I, my grandmother had 25 grandkids. I'm also the middle, number 13. Um, <laughs> so always just been balanced. Like there's always people older than me and people younger than me. Um, and always, I, I guess that kind of helped me to, to have the perspective that I have. Always trying to understand one side or the other because I've always been forced to be in the middle. So. And I think you have family here today. I do. I have. So let me tell you, because I, I just talked about my siblings. Um, so my mother has three children. My father, there's five of us, and I'm the oldest of my father's children. But I have some other sisters, and when I say sisters, these are not my biological sisters, but they are women who have walked alongside me at some point in my life, still are. They, they kind of came and they haven't kicked me out yet. <laughs> so uh, my sisters, these are my sister-in-laws, actually, the two on the end there, Laquita and Taquita. Uh, my sister in Christ, Kiera, she, she and I go to the same church. And then my sister, Kenya, who I met about a year ago through the uh, African American Leadership Program, and we immediately took to each other because we're kind of kindred spirits. Um, and so another sister in the crowd. And then I got to acknowledge um, my Maria Cartier, who is one of the team members at the port, so um, in the back. And my predecessor, Adam Tendrell Schlick, has also joined us. Right. And then Nick Desiato is also in the room. He... Uh, he and Mayor Johnson are responsible for me sitting in this chair, so I got to acknowledge him. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I know you asked about family, but that's just how my heart works. It's no. All of them. No, and Joan, Joan is here too, my city sister. So can't forget her. So um, you said you mentioned your grandmother. Yeah. Now, I've seen in other articles that your grandmother played a pretty important role in your life. She did. She did. So explain. So my grandmother. Um, it's interesting because my grandmother um, came here from Kent, Mississippi. She had a third grade education, but she knew enough to know that if, if we were going to do better, she had to show us better. And she didn't always have the means, but she always put us in spaces with people who did. Um, and our church community was really that where, where a lot of that came from. So I remember um, some, some women and some men who were really critical to um, kind of filling that gap because my parents weren't around at that point. And so... I know people always say, if you, you, you know, there, there should be challenges for somebody who doesn't grow up with parents, but I feel like God gave me people to fill those holes, and so I, I relied on them. Um, so they, we had a lady, Shirley McDonald, she's gone on to be with the Lord. She would take us after Sunday, after church, and we just go from one church to the next, seeing how other young people um, worship the Lord, and um, she, would, she would take us all over the place, and if it was something going on Saturday night, a musical or something, we were there. And so it's those people. Um, and then we were, I don't know if you remember the old, they call it welfare or W-2 now, but it used to be aid to families with dependent mm -hmm. children, right? Um, my grandmother was, that's what we were, well, we were on welfare. And she, so when I went to, I was in high school and um, our Spanish class was going to do a trip abroad. They were going to Mexico. And I was like, okay, I saw the cost and I'm like, there's no way. My grandmother has me and my two siblings. And then she still had two teenage daughters in the house, too. And I'm like, I'm not even going to ask. Somehow she found out. I don't know how, but she found out. And I knew the cost of the trip was more than she would get for, for a check every month. Somehow she made it happen because it was that important to her. And so that was just kind of how she moved. She would always make a way for us to go. And she didn't, she didn't with a third grade education, she didn't really have the vocabulary to express it. But she would always say, Jackie likes to see. And she always made a way for me to see whatever that meant, whatever I was interested in, she made it happen. And so she's really critical to making sure I was exposed to different opportunities. Um, if you look at my educational background, I kind of jumped all over the place. Um, my Let's talk my about work that. background, Let's I jumped talk all about over. That. So, so yeah. you said you, um, you wanted to be an accountant. Well, I originally wanted to be a teacher, right? Um, and then I guess the double edged sword of being exposed to all these different people is they all have an opinion too, right? <laughs> And so they told me, teachers don't make any money. You don't want to do that. And um, you should go into occupational therapy. And I'm like, I don't even know what that is. But I changed my major. How, I don't know how and why, but I did. And then I was like, this ain't really working. Um, and so I was at UWM. And um, we, didn't, we, of course, didn't have a lot of resource. So that was when computers were just kind of getting into high school. So I didn't have a lot of experience there. 
And I remember sitting in, a, um, in the computer lab at UWM, typing this paper out, and then I couldn't find out where it went. They were like, oh, you need a flash drive. And I'm like, I don't know what that is, you know? So I, th there's those little bumps that I had to get over. Um, but I ended up leaving UWM, and I think part of it was because it was just too large. Um, for somebody who's a first generation who really didn't have anybody to kind of go to and say, hey, how do you do this? And I wasn't, like y'all seeing me now, where I'm not afraid to speak, this is not who I was in 1995, okay? Um, so there's a lot of growth that has happened, but the, with, with the schooling, I, I, was, I was still um, very vocal and um, I had a lot of leadership qualities. People always saw stuff, whether it be teachers or um, people, I had summer jobs and people would say, you should do this, and they kind of pushed me in different directions. And so I ended up going into um, nonprofit work. And I worked for Rosalie Manor. They had a teen pregnancy prevention program. And so I worked for them as a mentor. And then when it came time for me to kind of move on, I really didn't know what I was going to do. Um, and so the program manager at the time, James Bowling, got to give him a shout out, because um, he was one of those paternal figures that filled the hole, right? And um, he said, well, I think we want to do something different with the mentor program. And I was such a strong mentor they created a position for me to kind of be over training all of the mentors. So I did that for a little while um, and then eventually um, moved on from Rosalie Manor. Um, I did a couple other programs, but I then went over to Our Next Generation because there was a gentleman that I worked with, Chris Banderzak. I'm giving shout outs all day, just shout, so y'all know. Shout him out. Um, he worked with me at Rosalie Manor and they had a position at Our Next Generation, which is another local nonprofit after school life skills program. And it was right in the neighborhood I grew up, so it, it just sounded like it fit. And so he called me. He's like, we got this position open, and it's in the paper. Make sure you look at it, and, and I need you to apply. And so I look at it, and they're like, you need a college degree. And I'm like, I don't really have that, so I know what to do. He said, no, apply anyway. And so I did, and they called me, and they're like, yeah, we want you to come. And when it came time to negotiate salary, they were like, well, yeah, we, we, this is what we posted, but you don't have a degree, so we won't pay you that. Well, I got tired of hearing that, so I went back to school. And so I thought I was going to be an accountant um, because logic, like, that just made sense to me. And then I got to, uh, I went to MATC, and I got to the income tax course, and I was like, this is not it. Um, <laughs> I don't want to do this. I was the same way here. <laughs> same way here for tax. So, so I, um, I was like, okay. But I was so close, I said, let me at least finish this out. But at Our Next Generation, there was a volunteer there, and she was talking to me about Alverno. She said, I think you'd be great. Um, the program there, the environment is going to be good. And um, so I went to one of their open houses and signed up right there. And then I, once I finished MATC with the accounting degree, um, I went to Alverno and I did their business program with a double major with professional communication. And so, yeah, that's how I can sit here today. Because if you talk to me, even last year, Kenya knows, um, we had to get up in front of the, the group at the leadership program. Tears. I mean, I'm just snotting and crying everywhere. <laughs> um, so to be able to sit here and that's, I know that's God because I'm like, you got to do something about these tears if you're going to have me standing in front of people because they're going to think I lost my mind up here crying. <laughs> um, and so I went there and then my husband's like, you, like you're knocking the school thing out. You should just keep going. And so then I went to uh, Concordia and got my MBA. And so here we are. And so from that point, you... You weren't a stranger to the port because you were working in the port. I, well, so I actually finished school before I went to the port, and that came interestingly too. This is God working, right? So I had worked. I started with the city in the treasurer's office, answering the phones. I learned about I always the way I tell it. My my city experience is the the treasurer's office taught me uh, how they collect the money. The budget office is where I went after that. They taught me how to spend it, and then the the port now teaches me why we need it. Um, and so that's kind of how my my uh, city history has gone, but I was in the budget office actually when the finance position at the port came open, and I really didn't know a lot about the port at the time. Um, I didn't even know if I was interested in that, and so I had mentioned it to my husband, and he was, I was like, I don't think I want to do it. And he's like, we're going to pray about it, like, because that's, that's always his answer when he wants me to really do something, but I'm, <laughs> he knows I'm strong-willed, right? And so he said, we're going to pray about it. I said, okay. Well, my, my phone, um, if you've got an iPhone, you know you can set it on Do Not Disturb so you don't get anything. And mine is like 10 o'clock to like 6. Well, 1.30 in the morning, I get an email alert. And I'm like, what is wrong with my phone? Well, it was a job notice for the port. And I'm like, okay, I hear you. I see. Like, I know what you, you're doing. 
And so I applied and went and interviewed and I was there. So I was at the port. Um, I went to the port right at the end of 2017 and was the finance officer up until the beginning of this year when I was appointed to port director. And I got to say, because I'm giving shout outs, Adam is in the back and Adam said, he and uh, Maria and I, we were at Harbor House and we were, we were there for a meeting, um, but we were just kind of hanging out because the people that were joining us weren't there yet. And he said to Maria and I, Jackie's gonna be the next port director. And I looked at him like, sir, who are you talking about? Like, <laughs> what Jackie, who? And I didn't know where it came from. And I just kind of sat there like, whatever, you know. Um, and then a little later on, I was like, okay, this is like, I feel like I've done what I need to do with this finance position. I'm starting to get bored. And I think when you get bored, it's time for you to move on because now you're not being challenged. And so I started looking and the Lord was laying that path out too. He was telling me like what to do and, and how to go. And um, at the same time, I was in the African-American leadership program. And um, Adam had mentioned that he, he was thinking there was a chance he might be moving on, but he wasn't sure yet. And I was like, don't gas me up on a humbug. Like, I don't, you're not even sure, so don't even tell me that, whatever. Um, I felt like it was a tease, so I wasn't really interested. And then when, when it came to where he said, okay, no, I actually am leaving, and I really want to um, tell the mayor's office to consider you. I was like, y'all need to recruit. Like, uh -uh, I, I don't think I want it. I'm thinking about like now you go from supervising one person to supervising 20. I don't really want to deal with that. I, I didn't want to do it. And then, of course, the Lord gets me together again. And it was really at the, um, the leadership program, our, our retreat. So they start the program with a retreat. And I was at breakfast with this group of women. I called them my council of women because they got me right together that morning. And I was telling them, you know, about the opportunity, all the reasons I didn't want it. And one of them said, I'm sorry, you just listed off all the reasons why you should do it. And then they all just kind of start going in. And I'm like, okay, y'all, like, okay, I'm a, uh, and then I use my husband's line on him. I'm like, I'm gonna pray about it. Um, <laughs> and so I, you know, talk to him and I, you know, I keep a, a journal. So there's a couple things with my, my um, spiritual life. There's this, this planner where when God says something to me, I write it on that day because my, the other part of who I am is legacy for my family. And so I want them to understand like what was going on. This is our history. And this is, this is kind of how our spirituality has kind of taken shape over the years. But I'm in this journal and um, I'm writing out my, my note in the other notebook where I just kind of write my prayers. And these words just started flowing. And, and then I'm like, okay, this is weird. Like, I don't know where this came from, but okay. And as I'm driving home or driving to work that morning, this song came on the radio and it's, um, I'm closing chapters, I'm turning pages. And I can't forget the, I can't remember the rest, but the song is called I'm Moving On. And I'm like, okay, Lord, like you're telling me it's time to do something else. So apply for the job um, and it's an appointed position. So some people around me were really upset because they feel like in an appointed position, the mayor can pick who he wants. He doesn't really have to talk to people if he doesn't want to, but I wanted them to recruit and um, it turns out that was good because I honestly didn't know if I wanted the job at first. And then when, when it turned out that way, I'm glad they recruited because the, the industry that I work in is so white male dominated that I needed to be, I needed people to be clear that nobody just put me here. I earned the right to be here. And so recruiting, going through that process and having to compete with other people who had great qualifications, that, that to me was a way to give me some solid foundation to stand on. So when people ask me, like, why they could have just put you, I'm so mad at that. I'm like, uh-uh, let the Lord do, do what he does because he knows. And I never would have thought about it that way. But after the fact, I'm like, that, that was the best way that it could have happened because now nobody can say they just gave it to you. You know, I earned the right to sit here in this chair. So Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So you have to explain this to me. So I was a city worker for 20 years as a judge in the municipal court, mm -hmm. and we aren't like other divisions. Yeah. So the municipal court is a separate branch of government, so we're not like Department of Public Works, Department of Neighborhood Services. Yeah. You have to explain to me the port, because the port's sort of like the same way. It's a little different. So we, we, are, um, we are considered an enterprise fund or a proprietary fund. See, that's that accounting coming back. Um, <laughs> But what that means is our, so with, with most city departments, the mayor's budget, when he puts that out, he's saying this is how much it's going to cost us to run this department. With us, our budget isn't, we, we do our budget process the same way everybody else does, but we have a revenue generating side. And so with an enterprise fund, your revenues and your expenses have to always match. 
with the port, we always start out with our, our revenues a little lower because our expenses are what they are, right? We, we don't try to overstate those because we always want to kind of be conservative in case we have a bad year. But um, at the end of the year, it's, it's typical, it's normal for the port to have more revenue than expenses. And so with that extra money, we call that our surplus, that goes back to the tax base. So that offers some um, tax relief to residents. If, if you guys are residents, it, it kind of helps you. So the port does a lot for, um, there's, it's a huge service. It's really a, um, a support to regional businesses. If you have products that need to go to international markets or international products that need to come into this region, the port is kind of that avenue. And so we're a liaison between business and all those different markets, so the imports and exports. But um, with the city, because we, we, we really don't cost the city anything to operate because we cover, for every dollar we spend, we raise a dollar. And so it's, it washes itself. Yeah. So let's talk about that. So I, I told you I've lived here for about 31 years, and I didn't know what the port was. Yeah. I drove by it by Stahone, and I was like, ah. Look at all that salt, right? Yeah, about, yeah. I was about to say that. So, so you tell me, what comes in and out of the port? Yeah, salt is by far one of our biggest commodities. Um, steel is another. We get a lot of European steel. And um, I'm going to look at Maria. If, if I get this wrong, she's going to give me a face. Um, <laughs> but because uh, Maria does a lot of this business, she's working really closely with our customers um, to make sure that we're getting the information we need to be able to do those reports. But salt and steel are by far our, our two largest commodities. Um, you probably heard a lot in the news about the um, agricultural, agricultural export merit. No, it's agricultural maritime export facility. I'm gonna call it AMEF from now on. Okay, so y'all know what I'm talking about. Um, but that that facility, which is operated by the DeLong Company, um, is new for the port. And so what that that's a new commodity that'll be agricultural exports. And so we wanna we wanna see that we wanna grow that business, and we're actually working now um, to try to grow that business to add some uh, capacity because we know there's such a need. There was a uh, grain terminal, Kafco, you may be familiar with it, a, a big grain terminal on the opposite side of the harbor. We didn't own it, but it shared, we shared the harbor with it. And that facility closed, and the property was sold to a company that their primary business is cement. And so we didn't think that there would be a, um, we didn't think there was a, a good potential that agriculture was gonna turn, return to that facility. And so DeLong, having just opened, is really going to serve kind of as that relief valve. So ag exports is another one. But we also do um, project cargo. So this is Brew City. We, we bring in a lot of brewery tanks. And they all don't stay in Milwaukee. Some of them go to, go to other parts of the state. But we can do that. We've done some um, super yacht structures. That's probably one of the cooler ones that has come in through the port. We do lumber. I mean, if there's a project, if we have the capacity, if we can work with our tenants, to provide the service, we want to be able to do it. Now so. you said tenants. Yes. So the port has tenants? We are a landlord port. So the difference between us and a, a, um, an operating port. An operating port, they own the land, they own the business, they do all the work. We own the land and the businesses do a lot of the work. Though our team, so we have 21 people um, at Port Milwaukee, and that's uh, we have finance and administration folks, we have our market development team, our engineers, and our operations division. And our operations division and engineering division do a lot with our tenants, for one, to make sure the infrastructure is safe and sound to be able to get those large ships docked up safely. Um, and that then our operations team, they do a lot of the support services. So the port owns a lot of equipment, um, some cranes, and um, we've got like a security trailer for the cruise thing. That's another thing we can get into. Yep. Okay. Um, but the they do a lot of the support. So if there's things that need to come off of a vessel and they require a heavy lift crane, we have that, we have the staff to be able to operate that. And so that's a support service that we offer. Um, we also own right on the port about 14 miles of rail track um, because that's what makes us intermodal. So we have the, the water, um, the, the commodities going in and out by vessel, um, by rail, and by truck. So that's what really makes you a port, an intermodal port. Um, and so we, they're, they're keeping up with those, um, the rail track, making sure that's sound. Um, we, we just did, we actually, it's kind of still in progress. We are upgrading our track because there was some older uh, infrastructure we're upgrading now so that it can handle the larger cars or the heavier weights. Um, so uh, we've got, a, our team has kind of got, we, I, I call us a small team with big ideas and, and big impact um, because we, our, our thing is to facilitate what goes on and make sure that the infrastructure and the equipment is available so that our, our tenants and the businesses and the customers can do what they need to do. And so that's really the role that we play. Now, are there any tenants that you can tell us about that we might know? Um, 
Well, I don't know if you know them, but that, that salt that um, keeps us from sliding all over the highways in the winter, that comes from the port. Um, the, I know the, the city does, DPW has the salt contract for the city, but the, the vendor that they get it through is a port tenant. Okay. Um, and so they're, they're, that's those guys, um, DeLong, of course, we know, I think most of them, we have a lot of um, industrial businesses, so I don't know if the everyday resident would be as familiar with them. Um, but you definitely see it if you go to Menards or Home Depot or wherever to uh, grab a bag of salt, it's a good chance it came through the port. So. All right. So just for an idea so we can see it visually, how big is the port and where does it start and end boundaries? So it's, um, we have about 467 acres, right, Maria? <laughs> Um, 467 acres, and we have, so I should clarify, we've got the commercial side, but we also have a recreational side. So Milwaukee World Festival, Summerfest, that is also port property. So they are a, um, a lease, they're a tenant of so Port Milwaukee. Tenant. They are. Okay. Um, Discovery World is also a tenant. Harbor House is a tenant. And so our land on the north end ends right at the steps of the art museum, and so going back. But then on the other side, you go across the home, all that industrial space that you see with like those big salt domes and the big salt piles, um, that is all port property. We also, so now I see where you're going with that question. Um, the Coast Guard is also a tenant of ours. Um, the uh, Navy is a tenant and we work closely with them. We work with the Army Corps of Engineers. They don't have a, um, a building here, but we support them when they come in. I mean, they use our parking lot. I mean, we, we just try to be a resource where we can. Um, so they use a building with some of their other uh, military counterparts, but. We, we work closely with them because they also, if you've been out on one of the, uh, the river boats here, you know if you go past that breakwater, it gets real choppy. The Army Corps makes sure that that water, that break wall is, is there and it's sound and they keep that intact um, so that we all can enjoy the lakefront without uh, vomiting, basically. <laughs> 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 So would, would the Lake Express be a tenant or no? It is. Okay, it, it is. is. Okay. You, see, you know more about the well, park Well, I, I did a little research. Yeah, I did a little yeah, research, they so. are. And they, so actually, the Lake Express is a good uh, geographic point because the Port Administration Building is directly across from the Lake Express. If you've go, gone across 794 and you see that big wind turbine, that's our building. So that, that turbine actually it produces enough energy to um, power our administration building and then wow. some. So we actually... Um, Y'all send we energies a check, they send us one. So we like to say that. <laughs> yeah, so we, we get some uh, revenue from that as well. So Mayor Johnson appointed you as point director. As I mentioned in the opening, you were the first woman, first person mm -hmm. of color. Could you tell me what that means to you? Well, to me it means doing the work to make sure I'm not the last. So that, that is a great responsibility for me. And when, when I was appointed, um, people saw it, they, they like, your name is in your face in the paper. I saw you on the news. Congratulations. What do you do? <laughs> um, and so my, my goal is to make sure that people don't continue to have to ask that question, that they start to understand. And so what we're doing is, um, and Maria's working really closely with me on this, to really engage the community. I think cruising, Great Lakes Cruising, has done a lot to kind of elevate our profile because that's something that people can relate to. You, you probably don't, like, you don't care how to salt gear here as long as you can pick it up at the store, right? But cruising, that's visible. People are like, we got cruise ships? In Milwaukee. It's still, every time yeah. I drive by the lake, I'm like, are you kidding yeah, me? Yeah, we had 30, 30 ships this year by the end of, we got two more coming, but we'll have 30 by the end of the year. Um, and, and they love Milwaukee, so you're starting to see all of these um, articles about people who know about Milwaukee. Part of it is because they've come into Port Milwaukee on a cruise ship. So it's highlighting our profile, but I think the other piece of that is there, there's, like if you live in Bayview, you know about the port. Those are our, like, there's our regular people. They, they call us like, hey, what's going on down there? I saw something that didn't look, quite look right. That's their level of involvement. But we want to bring people who are not necessarily coming across the home every day or not having to get off that 794 ramp all the time um, to help them understand the, the asset that's right here in their city, how it operates, why it's important to them, and, and how it supports our economy. And so um, she, Maria's done some work with NPS to get the guidance counselors to come in. So like if they know about it, they can start to kind of maybe encourage the teachers to say, here's another job shadowing opportunity, or here's an opportunity for you to take your students so they can learn about it. Because one, one of the things that I think is really important to know is the, the poor has a lot of um, career opportunity for people who may not necessarily ha be ready for college. Um, there's some, some nice family supporting um, entry level jobs 
that are available even through our um, department. We've got our port operations technicians. They make a nice wage, but it, it doesn't require you to go to school, and we provide some on-the-job training. So there's that, um, but there's a bunch of tenants, too. All of our tenants have staff that um, operate their business, and so there's some opportunity there. Maritime is a huge career that a lot of people never consider. And so we worked with, um, the Navy League has been to the port, and they actually had a ship here, or uh, um, one of their training vessels was here, uh, the Navy, not the Navy League, because they're different. But the Navy League was visiting that day. They hosted their meeting, and we talked to them about po potentially partnering so that they can help us, because they support um, maritime education through scholarships. And so we want to be able to expose people. And I always say, in order for you to aspire for something, you first have to be exposed to it. And so that's my goal, is to really expose more young people in our community, or even adults who are trying to figure it out, like they're over whatever they're doing, um, there's opportunities there. And so we want to make sure that people know about the port, that there's a way for them to engage, um, because most of our business, of course, is with um, larger industrial employers. So, so you mentioned briefly about uh, cruise ships coming mm -hmm. into the port. And I know when the cruise ships first started coming, they were docking at Discovery Wharf. Yeah. But those were small ships. Yeah. I saw a ship just this summer. It was Viking. enormous. The Viking. Viking it yes. was enormous. So where are they? So, well, they're in our heavy lift dock right now, and we want to get them out of there because if you know anything about the port, MMSD is down there, and if you've ever been across the home bridge about 6 in the morning, it is not nice. Um, so, welcome to Milwaukee. <laughs> yeah, we don't want that to be the welcome, right? So we, are, um, we, we have three locations right now that a cruise ship can dock. So the smallest do dock down at Pier, Wisconsin, right behind Discovery World. Um, the other dock, our South Shore cruise dock currently um, for the medium ships, is right behind where the Lake Express term, uh, ferry docks. And then the bigger ship, the Viking, um, that's the, the largest ship right now that can come into the Great Lakes, a cruise ship anyway. Um, they're at our city heavy lift dock, which is right in the middle of our commercial operation. So we want to get them out of there. So we're right in the process of designing a new cruise dock that will go on the east face of the Lake Express, uh, that, that land right behind Lake Express. And so that's where we want to be able to host our larger ships in the future. So we're working on that right now. So with the cruise ships, mm -hmm. all you, you let them dock, do you have any other, you, do you maintain them at all? Or do, yeah, what do well, you, we don't, they, they so. The are crew, they a tenant? They are not a tenant. Okay. And well, it, that's a loaded question actually, because Pearl Seas, which is one of our cruise companies, does have a, we call it a priority agreement. So. If you go down by um, South or Pier, Wisconsin, you'll see their name is actually on a sign down there. That's because they pay for um, that priority agreement. They want first dibs on that dock. Um, and a lot of it is because people really want to have that entry right into downtown, so that dock is really perfect for that. Um, but we, this, we offer a lot of support services, so that's where our operations team comes in again. They do the, because uh, uh, some of these passengers are international, right? And you don't want to get out on the water with somebody who's got something in their bag they shouldn't have. So we have a security trailer that looks just like that scanner at the airport that we send all those bags through. And our team, we own that. And we have a, um, our security vendor actually operates it. But our team is the one loading those bags on. They're doing the, the, the check and the verification. But our team is loading those on. And then they're loading the bags onto the ship. So you don't, you, you come in, you drop your bag. They take care of it. When you get on the ship, it's, it's there because they put it on the cart, lifted it up so somebody on the ship can get it off. So they offer that. Um, they also do, we have our security partners. So the cruise operation is really a, a community partnership. Visit Milwaukee has a heavy hand in it. Because the way I, I like to tell the story is our primary business is commercial cargo. Um, we don't know how to handle cargo with attitude, um, but that's what <laughs> cruise passengers are, right? So they have opinions, and we want to make sure that, that that's a good experience. And so we work with the professionals. Visit Milwaukee knows how to visit Milwaukee, right? So we work with them, and we also have a really great partner, um, Teresa Nimitz, who owns Great Lakes Shore Excursions. She is phenomenal. I mean, she, she makes sure that this thing runs smoothly. She's telling us where the kinks are and how to iron them out. And so we work really closely with her. We've got our, our security contractor that we work with who's providing, making sure that the right people are getting um, near the ship and the wrong people are not. Um, and so there's, it's, it's a, a, big, a big collaboration. Um, we want to make sure that businesses who are interested in servicing those passengers have a voice. So that's where Visit and Teresa again come in. Because she's, she's playing. It's just like if you, if you were to go in, on a cruise in the Caribbean 
um, and you get off and you do a shore excursion. They do that in Milwaukee, but she's doing like, I think it's the, uh, what is it, the brats and, or beers and they're, they're going to churches, they're going to breweries, they're going to museums, they're, they're going all over the place, but she's coordinating all of that. And so she's a really important partner to make that smooth. Um, and Adam's gonna love this, because somebody called us the Miami of the Midwest, <laughs> and so we're really trying to make sure that we like hang on to that reputation. And so we're always looking for every at the end of every season, we're doing a debrief to kind of see how can we do better? How can we improve this service? And we're working with the cruise companies as well to get their feedback from the customers. And they love Milwaukee. So whatever y'all are doing to welcome them, please keep doing it. But it's important to mention yeah. about the shore excursions. Uh, they're always looking for people. That's right. So they're looking for people who are willing to drive to those locations you talk about, who want to pick up people at the airport, things of that nature. So if anybody here is looking for a side gig over the summer, it's actually a nice little, because yeah. they they're always putting out, yeah. we need people to work. So you mentioned the uh, turbine, which is on the south end of the port, mm -hmm. and how it's, uh, you talked about environmental sustainability, how it runs your administration building. Yeah. So we have all these cruise ships coming in. Um, is the port responsible for making sure that they're not bringing invasive species, that they're not lowering, uh, emptying their bilge out into yeah. our lake? So, so a bit, another part of um, what we do at the port is we work with um, regional and international, binational, I guess we call it, um, groups that are always looking at how do we ensure that we safeguard against these kinds of things. And so in order to come into Lake Michigan through um, the seaway, you have to go through a series of locks. And so there are, a lot of that stuff is happening before they get to us, but we do have rules they have to follow. So when, when they're coming with, um, they have to, of course, it's just like an airplane, like there's waste, you gotta get rid of it. There's trucks, there's businesses here that provide that service. So we, we don't necessarily work with them, we work with a ship agent who is coordinating all of that work, but if they're, they're looking for resources in the city, that's where we come in and kind of direct them to those folks. Yeah. And so, I, Tell me if I'm wrong. So the port is able to take uh, goods from the port and get through the Mississippi all the way That's down the right. Gulf. That's right. And then we use the St. Lawrence yep. to get out to the East Coast and then Yeah. Across. So the, the St. Lawrence is where we get the international, tra the, the, the bigger ships, the international ships. So those are coming from the ocean into the seaway, into the lakes. The uh, river system, those are the barges. So those are smaller. Um, and those, those do go, we do have access to the Mississippi and they can go all the way down to the, the, the Gulf Coast, so, okay. yeah. All right, so I, um, I wanna talk about this because I know it's really important to you. So you, we talked about your spirituality mm -hmm. and you mentioned, oh, is there anything about the port that I missed? I, I don't know, Maria, okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> She's gonna be so embarrassed, I'm sorry, Maria. We go, I'm gonna take her to lunch, we are gonna get this together. <laughs> Good. Um, so you, you recently became a minister. Mm -hmm. Explain that process and that Ooh, calling. Ooh, we yes. So, um, and, and my, so I go. I grew up Black Baptist, y'all. So when we when we talk about ministry and what you're called to um, spiritually, um, I've known for a long time that I was supposed to be a minister. And when when you don't follow it, we call that running. You running from God. Um, and so I've been running for a long time. And. <laughs> Part of it was because the way I was raised, women were not ministers. You, they did not believe in men, uh, women preachers in the church I grew up in. And so for a long time I was conflicted because I'm like, how is my spirit telling me this thing? And then there's, so I really had to get clear about it for myself. And so I think the, the journaling, that started, um, I wanna say the fall of 2021. I went to a women's retreat, shout out to Camille. Uh, she, she hosts a, a Press But Not Broken retreat, which I actually want to again at the end of the month. But that, there was a, a prayer workshop in that, uh, at that retreat that I took. And um, the woman who led it basically was talking about what is your, if, if nothing in your prayer life changes now, what does that mean for you? What does that mean for your family? And the Lord was basically telling me like, there's a spiritual legacy, there's a shift that needs to happen and it will happen either through you or in spite of you. Well, I don't want to be spited by God, so let's go through, right? So we want to keep this path straight. And so I continue with the journaling, and so he's kind of leading me through these things. And then I did a 30-day devotional. Every morning at 6 o'clock, we're getting up. We're in fellowship with other women. And um, th it just kept building and building and building. And then I, um, I, I just wrote the question in my journal, am I supposed to preach? 
And so a couple of days went on, keep going through this devotional, and then the Lord got me up. This is when the early morning started. And it was like 3 in the morning, and I went to my Bible. And I'm thinking, like, he's going to send me to the story of Deborah, right, because that's a woman warrior. Like, we know that. Nope, he sent me to the story of Gideon um, and how Gideon thought he wasn't good enough. He had, I didn't come from the right family. I've got all these, all these reasons. And every question that Gideon asked, I had written in that journal. And he's like, this is you too. Like, this is what I meant for you, and this is what you're supposed to be doing. And I had three things. I, there was a, a woman I was supposed to tell because she, she had already become a minister. So I needed to share with her. I needed to share with my pastor right away um, because if I didn't do it right away, I wasn't going to do it. Um, and then I needed to let my, community, my, my close community of friends know. And so I did. And my pastor, it's so funny, he said, so when I told him, I said, I'm, I've, I've accepted the call to preach. He says, well, what if I don't accept it? I said, well, that's between you and God, because I did too much work to get here. Like, <laughs> I had to overcome so much. And so we, we laughed about it. He was joking or whatever. So I did my first sermon um, in July of, that was last year, last year, just a year ago. Um, and so that, that was my public sermon. But I feel like I do sermons all the time, and I've been doing them. I just wasn't on a uh, platform. Y'all laughing. See, they know stuff about me that y'all don't know. So we're going to figure out what that was later. But because um, they know I've been, I've been preaching to them for a long time. I'm always the oldest in my friend group. Um, and so I'm, I'm and I've been maternal. We talked about that already. So when people got something going on, they're always like, OK, I need you to listen to this. And I'm not that friend that's going to be like, oh, I'm like, OK, girl, we got to do something else. Like, we're not going to sit here. I don't do pity parties. Um, I've, I've got friends who will sit in it with you. I'm the one that says, okay, you've been sitting long enough. It's time to get up. We got to do something else. And so we all have our different personalities. And um, so, yeah, that's kind of how that happened. So now I feel like he's sending me somewhere else. Part, this is part of it. Like yeah. putting me on a platform. This is not my platform. This is a platform for me to share about the goodness of God. And I, I'm, I'm still a professional. I can do the jobs. So let's be clear about that. Um, but... I'm always, if you ever see me in public, I'm going to figure out a way to honor him. And at my church, they, all, they, they get up and they say, give an honor to God who's out of my life. Well, that sounds kind of crazy at a press conference. But he'll give me an opening joke or something um, that will, and, and sometimes it'll carry through. Like other people will pick it up and they'll keep going with it. So I know it's him speaking to me. And so that's just how I move. And so. I kind of noticed that. I watched yeah. your, uh, your oath. Yeah. Right? And you mentioned the fact when you took the oath, that you were offered the option to take the oath by phone. Yeah. Right? Which is, I think, how I did it. Yeah. Right? But you wanted to do it in front well, of the... I, I didn't want to do it. They did. <laughs> um, and, and I will say, because I, I wasn't really, again, that's when I went through that African-American leadership program, I think all of that gets us here today. And part of that was me owning the fact that there is greatness in me and that he has a calling for me and I need to just walk in it. So not questioning it not worrying about what people are going to think about it, but just do it. That's that Nike spirit, y'all. Um, but just do it, right? And so when, when, I, when I was going to um, be sworn in, when I talk, talked to my family about it, first of all, let's be, my family is a trip, right? When I told them the, that we were scheduling it because they were on me like, no, you can't do it over the phone. We got to do something. We got to have a party. We got to come. We all want to be there. And I'm like, okay. Um, so we scheduled it. Do you know these people went and had some t-shirts made with my entire, vis I said, y'all will not wear those to no swearing in. And so they, they did, and they gave me a break that day. But then we went, we kind of went out afterwards. And they all showed up with those shirts on, and my colleagues were there. And they bought them. <laughs> so I'm like, so there, there's a couple people at City Hall who's got this shirt with my whole face on it. Um, and so it, it's funny. I just let them do what they do. But... It was really important to me because when, when I think about what I value, um, faith is, is a value, legacy and wisdom. And so part of my legacy is kind of being the one to take that step. Um, as you, you mentioned, trailblazer. Like, I never thought of myself that way. But it is that. When you're the first to do something, you, that, that's what you are. And so making sure that they have an opportunity to witness that and see that and be part of it. And so encouraging them that they can, they can do the same. So. So my last question before I open it up to questions from the audience, um, what is the future of the port? What do you see as the future? So our theme for this year has kind of been um, 
building on the momentum because I think there were a lot of great things going on at the port um, and I was there as a finance officer so I knew kind of the direction we were headed and I think just continue to build on that but I think the the biggest part for me is making sure that we're serving the businesses here we do a lot of imports and so it's great for international business it's great that we can get those products and we have access to them but I think there's some great products in our region that need to see international spaces and so we're be, we've been doing some work to kind of redirect how we spend our time um, in, in the, we do a, a lot of conferences and um, go to trade events and things like that, but really trying to redirect our focus so that we are serving the community that we're in, the region that we're in, the states around us, so that we all continue to, drive, to thrive. Because the port is, a, um, is an economic driver, not just for the city, but for the state. And we want to make sure that that is not just what's coming in, but that the, the people who have businesses who need to get their commodities to other markets, DeLong is a great example of that, that they have access, that they know we're here, they know what we can provide, and that they're coming to us to, to help facilitate that. Love it. All right, at this time, uh, we have um, a microphone. Uh, Hillary, I think this gentleman here has a question. Oh, good afternoon. Thanks for, uh, for your story. It's Thanks. interesting. Um, one of the things that uh, I was a uh, uh, guide on a, on a riverboat for a while and did a lot of talking about the harbor, noticed that uh, we're not bringing as much coal in as before, I don't think. And Amen. And noticed that you just mentioned some of the agricultural products that uh, aren't being processed there anymore. How did you make up that, uh, that uh, deadfall? Well, I think, so So coal was, I can't take credit for that, let me be clear. Um, that was, coal was, was going away or had been already, it was really gone before I came to Port Milwaukee. Um, but I think that the, the folks who were there were, at, were working hard to make sure that we could replace that commodities. There's a lot of salt pads at the port and some, I think some of those spaces were taken up by salt pads. There's also where I think most of the coal production happened is across the harbor where now that facility is where Michaels, um, a local company, that they're a tenant of the port, and so that's their leasehold now. And so they're really gearing up to do a, um, a maritime-based business where they, they do some, I don't exactly know, we actually have a meeting with him um, coming up to really understand how we can support them in that business, but I know they're shifting to a maritime focus to be able to do their construction business in a different way. Um, so that's one way that it's happened. But I think when we talked about environmental sustainability, you'll continue to see that we're getting away from those kinds of commodities. Um, not that we'll turn away from them completely because there are some, there's still a need for some of that. Um, but we do want to make sure that we're being mindful of the environment and, and how we do business and preparing for what's to come because most people are moving towards clean energy. And so we don't want to become reliant on something that's going out of business, right? So that's kind of how that happened. Um, how does the Port of Milwaukee compare with other ports on the Great Lakes? Hoo wee. So um, there's a line in the industry that says if you've seen one port, you've seen one port, uh, because they're all very different. Like you, it's it's really hard to compare because we all have different. Depending on the region you're in, the kind of products that you need to bring in are, is going to be different. Your footprint is different. Our structure. We're a landlord port. Some of them are operating ports, so that can be very different. I can say that we are the largest commercial port in the state of Wisconsin, um, but we also have some, uh, that's right, Maria, right? <laughs> Always check it. But there, there's some other ports on the Great Lakes that we also, we, th there's this thing, I, I don't know who pegged this, I think it was Adam, but there's a thing called cooperation, meaning we have to cooperate, but we also compete. Because, and the reason we have to cooperate is because we want the business in the region, period. Of course we want it at our port, but if we can get it into the Great Lakes, that's great too. And so while we, we don't compare apples to apples, we're always supporting each other and working together. But we are the largest port in the state, commercial port. Hey Jackie, this hey. is great. Thank you so much for sharing all this information. I love learning so much about the port. And, and one of my questions is, as far as operations go, is um, are, are the operations pretty much um, governed by mostly state statutes or is it also federal code uh, like u.s code and federal regulations so it depends we uh, so the port is uh, the reason we are an enterprise fund is because that is defined in the statutes so the way we are set up as part of the city of milwaukee is a statutory um, requirement 
but we do, we're governed by anything. If, if it's maritime, if there's a maritime law attached to it, we're governed by that as well. So it just really depends on the activity that we're doing. I mean, there's, we've got, we work with the uh, Department of Transportation on the federal and the state level. We work with uh, uh, department's administration, federal and state level. So it just depends on what activity, but absolutely. Um, and even some international laws as well. Back in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of ships coming from, from Europe, from Yugoslavia specifically. They were taking a lot of huge logs and a lot of tallow from Milwaukee area overseas. Um, and then there was, a, I believe, a port strike or something like that, and a lot of that cargo moved down to Kenosha, I believe, and maybe Chicago. Did any of that ever come back? The fact that I don't know what tallow is tells me no. Um, <laughs> I think I know, but I might be wrong because I'm thinking barbecue, and I don't think that's right. Um, it, it well, is, yeah. It, is that? It, it is actually a, 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 a animal fat. Okay. That is, you know, that goes through the liquid terminal that was kind of separate, and it's actually heated. It's warm while they transport it onto the ship, and they have to keep it warm Got before it. it solidifies so that it can be loaded and unloaded as a liquid. If it ever gets cold, you literally have to chop it in chunks with an axe Got and it. carry it out piece by piece instead. But it's used for obviously all kinds of stuff, including perfumes and, okay. and, and uh, soaps and stuff like that. I believe that used to go to Spain mostly, but I'm not positive on that. Well, th thank you for that, because just, I just learned something too now. Um, but I, that is not familiar to me, so I'm going to say probably not. Now, we do have a liquid cargo terminal, so we do have the capacity. So now you just gave us something to chase down and see if we can see if there's some business there. So thank you. Thank you. Mine's kind of a historical question too, uh, based on the fact that I think you said the number two or the, one of the largest imports is steel mm -hmm. from Europe. Because historically, uh, the, the biggest reason to have a port here and in Racine before Milwaukee became a good port, you know, blasted through, was to transport iron mm -hmm. from upper Peninsula, northern Wisconsin. Do we do we do that anymore? Do we export any? Iron? Yeah, we're not seeing a lot of that. Um, a lot of our, our steel does come from Europe, and a lot it's used in um, the tin making process for food for cans for food. Um, so we don't. I don't. I'm not familiar with a trade lane from where you're talking. Yeah. I don't. I'm not seeing. That doesn't mean it's not happening because our there's a lot of people involved in our process and our reporting. So. Yeah, okay, say superior so Duluth Superior is, is doing that business. Yep. Thank you. Oh, poor Hillary, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm coming. First of all, thank you. It's been a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. When you look around the country at your colleagues, how many women do you see in the same capacity how many people of color, just kind of roughly? Who we? Um, I kind of knew this was coming, and uh, my grandmother would call it. Uh, she would say, "You're you're a fly in the buttermilk. That means you stand out. There's no mistaking you're in there, and that's kind of how it is. Um, there are not a lot of there. There are some men of color who leave ports. My Great Lakes colleagues really are convinced that I am the first woman of color in the country, but nobody tracks it, so we don't know." And God, I do not want to say that. And then somebody pop up, no, nah, I was first. We're not doing that. So um, they, there's not a lot of us. There are some, some, some other women. Um, I know the, the port of uh, New York, New Jersey, has a, a woman leading it, Duluth. Um, there's a woman. Um, but there, it's, it's still very rare to see a woman lead a commercial port. So, And we had our budget hearing earlier this week, and we were talking about um, diversity. And so one of the things I told the council we can really hang our hat on is you know, we've kind of blazed a trail in that, that we were one of the first to come to the table or brave enough to allow a woman of color to sit in this seat. But the other thing that I learned as I was appointed, uh, Milwaukee was also the first port in the country to appoint a woman as deputy port director. So they made history in the past before. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Benjamin Jackson. I'm the assistant for Alderman John Nabrasov with the city of Milwaukee. Um, I just have a quick question um, regarding the cruises. Do you know how many years or how long has Milwaukee hosted these cruises? 
2017? We well, it goes back to 14. I think we just did this research. 2014 is when they they were coming, but they weren't consistent. And then in in 2019, we got a few more. And then 2020 happened. Y'all know what happened there, right? It, everything shut down. And then 2022, they like came back. And part of that was not only uh, some of the ones that we have been hosting coming, but Viking had been they actually built the Octantis. The Viking Octantis was built specifically for the Great Lakes. So 2022 was the first year that that ship sailed. It's, Milwaukee is a home port for that vessel. They built the second one that visited the port this year. So we had actually two Viking ships in Port Milwaukee at the same time. One at the dock, one was tendered out um, in the harbor, and they, they were tendering those passengers in. Um, so yeah, they, we, we hope it'll continue to grow. We've been a part of some of the, the groups that are talking about how that industry is growing. So we're hoping to see some more uh, vessels come, come to the city um, and come into the Great Lakes period again, that co-opetition. We just want them to understand this region. I think people are starting to value the assets that we have, some of the stuff we probably take for granted because we see it every day. A lot of people are really just blown away by all the, the beauty and the, the attractions that are on the Great Lakes. So Thank you. you're welcome. I, I think I read that it was like I'm a thousand here. people the first so, year, a thousand passengers yeah. that came to Milwaukee. And then this past year, it was like 33,000. 13,000. Um, thir we had 33 ships, 13,000 passengers um, that came to Milwaukee. And this year, we by the end of the season, because we had two vessels yet to come, um, 30 ships, and we always estimate the passengers on about 80% capacity, so we're thinking like maybe about 10 or 11,000 people. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, I was wondering how changing water levels in Lake Michigan affect the port, and if there's a plan for like rise in the water level of Lake Michigan? Yeah, so the impact that has on us is when a vessel comes in and it's docked, that can that can determine whether or not they can dock safely because if the water level is low there's a certain um depth that vessels need in order to, to dock without digging everything on the bottom up and so the low water levels of course that becomes a risk um we work with the army corps to make sure that that's monitoring they, they monitor that regularly and so we're getting those reports and you know always looking at that and one of the ways that we can deal with that um, for our operation is there's a way to kind of push the vessel out. We use these big fenders to push them out because as you go out into the water, it becomes deeper. So we can push them out to make sure our operation still happens. But um, in terms of what that means for the environment, the high water level is really um, an issue. And, and one of the, the examples of that was in January of 2020, we had this storm that major winter storm, so much damage at the port, I think it was like $2 million in damage. Um, and people, I think people don't, they, they sometimes can underestimate how dangerous water can be, but you get the water, the ice, the wind, and I mean, the port was pretty much flooded. Um, so we're always monitoring that, and, and we work with partners to understand what the risk is, what that means, and then how we address it to ensure that everything is safe for everybody, the, the people who are operating and the residents as well. So also, the port is the home of the smallest city park. It in, is. In it I, I is. Love, I love it. And y'all laugh, so y'all been down there. Yeah, uh, doors <laughs> open. I went to doors open. Yeah. I, saw, I didn't even know it existed. Yeah, Kashub's Park is smaller than this room, actually. Probably half of, half of this ha room. Oh, yeah. Um, but there is a... So the, the, the reason that park is there, the original descendants of Jones Island, the Kashub's people, um, they, some people call them the Fisher, uh, Fisher folks. Um, and there's a lot of books, and um, there was a documentary, PBS did a documentary maybe about a year and a half ago that um, was all about the Kashub people and their history. And so that park is there to honor that history. Um, and we, we visit with them. They have an annual picnic there every year, and we go down and um, check in. They're doing, this year they were doing some genealogy and just trying to make sure that those traditions live on. That's where the Milwaukee fish fry started, just in case y'all didn't know. Um, the Kashub started um, that tradition. So. Thank yeah. you. So I want to thank everybody for taking time, spending this uh, lunchtime hour with us. I really appreciate it. I want to thank our guest, thank Jackie you. Q. Carter, Thanks for being for here me. and all the information we learned about the port. Can we give a round of applause? So please keep an eye out for our further programming. We have some uh, great events coming up. Uh, so please take a look on the website and also uh, look out for the information that's provided um, by Hillary, Hillary DuBlois, who's the program manager of Lubar Center over there. Um, thank you, Hillary.
and everybody get home safely. And uh, I'm looking forward to the when the winter comes, I can say, you know where that salt came from? That's right. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Great.